Hi there. I wanted to talk about circuit boards, breadboards, etching your own boards, salvaging boards from devices, maybe even scavenging boards from closed manufacturers or repair shops that had stock of blank boards, replacement boards, things like that. So let's look at some circuit boards. Most of these are salvage, not all of them. Some of them are breadboards, some of them are blank, some of them are salvaged from a factory. Many of them are salvaged from service shops. Look for these things in flea markets. They'll be inside boxes and you'll never even know what's in the box unless you're able to open it. Could be a treasure, could be trash, you never know. Obviously you want to deal with the trash immediately or it will consume your life. You need to be good at identifying treasures and not just thinking everything's valuable because somebody threw it away. So let's look at some of these things. If you're making your own circuits, you're probably going to prototype it. There's a few options for prototyping here. You've got this guy. This is a Radio Shack board. You can see it has traces on it with multiple contacts. There's bus lines. And there's bus lines as well as individual pads with three contacts apiece. The bus lines you'd use for power, ground. This is similar. And you don't want to get these confused here. These are both sold by Radio Shack. They still sell them. These are solder ringed holes on this board. That means there are no two holes that are bridged together. Every hole is independent, has its own ring. This, I have no idea. I mean, clearly this is... Well, there's no clearly about it. I don't, I don't really know what that would have been used for. This is bizarre. I have used it for driving an audio circuit, musical instrument. I'm sure that's completely outside the box for this component. But these, there are bus lines going along one direction. This was out of a circuit of some sort. It's a blank board. So this probably came out of an assembly shop. Maybe somebody had a bunch of boards run. They were populating the parts themselves as they got orders. Here you got a card edge. Think what you could do with a card edge. I mean, it's not a very good card edge. If you're building a robot or something, you could have the slot edge interfacing into your servos. This is an audio preamp of some sort. This is the blank board. So I've gone ahead and built this up. I was able to determine, just through experience, honestly, I have worked on enough electronics over the past 20 years to know what components were used in a circuit just based on the resistors and capacitors and the pinout of the chip and that sort of thing. So I knew what this was. I had some old parts laying around. These are bizarre transistors I just had you know, in the box. They work. Circuit works. It's a mic preamp. Go figure. But hey, after you get some experience, you can do these things. You can find something in the middle of the flea market that everybody would dismiss as trash and make something useful out of it. Look at that. It's a Nixie tube driver. Again, salvage. This right here. This is really an example use of one of these boards from Radio Shack. I have it lined with headers. These headers are for a Motorola two-way radio repeater. So this, these two, these couple wires I have here were wired up to uh, jump across for a few things that need to go between so you'd have the receiver on one side and the transmitter on the other. Now, we've got circuitry between. What's that going to be? Well, I intended it to be an interface panel. I don't want to use the Motorola controller. It's junk. It doesn't do the things I want. This right here, now this is something I don't want you to be too intimidated about building your own circuits. Even kits. Even things that might seem like they're complicated. Make sure you have the proper tools. Again, 
proper tools. That's a solder wick. I won't go into how to use it. Read about it. Watch videos online. Buy some quality solder. Don't use junk. This is Kester. You can't get better than Kester. In my opinion, very high quality. But this, this was a blank board. I bought this board. There are a lot of kits that way. You could buy just the board. You don't have to buy the parts, especially if you have some of your own parts. You know, usually there'll be a bill of materials with a board like this. So you can buy the board. If you look at sites like uh, Adafruit, I believe, you'll find they almost always sell the board individually. Where you can buy it without parts and buy your own part. It gives you the opportunity of buying parts in bulk. So you can buy 15 or 20 Atmel microcontrollers at a time and save yourself a lot of money on parts and then buy the board individually. Some other salvaged items. That looks meaningless, I would suspect, to a lot of people. This little guy is not. This is a dial light. This is hugely useful. If you need an LED 7 segment display, all you need is this board and your set. This basically has a parallel input. So you could drive this straight from many ICs. These input pins will drive straight from many ICs. This uh, board here is also salvage. I have thousands of these. These are very useful. They're any 567 chip with all of the accompanying circuitry to make it work. 567 is a, a phase lock loop tone decoder. You supply an oscillator and it compares any audio input into the chip or really any signal input into the chip. It compares it to the running oscillator, the RC pair. If they match, then the output goes high. If they don't match, it stays low. And look at the chips that are on stuff. If you go to a flea market and you see a bunch of boards laying there, look at the chips on them. Try to understand what they are. If you have a smartphone, look them up. The board right here out of a weather station, that board measures temperature and humidity. Well, after a while, the humidity sensors go bad. You can see the board's made for a couple different types of humidity sensors. For $10 or less and some time, you can rebuild the thing yourself. Sometimes you're not going to actually even need a circuit board to build a circuit. But this right here is an antenna tuner that I built. Very simple. This is a fairly simple construction. I just salvaged a case from something else, flipped the panel around on the front so the printing was on the inside. This might seem like a piece of junk, but I picked this up at a flea market. It is some sort of digital research branded light meter, I think, originally. Obviously, uh, whoever had it had a bad component in it, so they pulled that component, never re replaced it, never repaired it, whatever, they threw it in the flea market for, you know, a nickel. It has a uh, potentiometer on the back to adjust something, I don't know, maybe a calibrate, whatever. What I got it for was a uh, Halloween decoration. You see I've uh, hacked up the circuitry a little bit here, and uh, I made a, a, a Cylon pumpkin. So instead of measuring light, it actually just bounces the light back and forth like your uh, good old Cylons. And uh, carefully planted that into a pumpkin, and eh, that was fun for a few hours. So here's a blank circuit board. It's never been etched. This is something you can etch yourself. Look for blank circuit boards at flea markets and things like that. You'll find them because a lot of people don't know what they are. This one... Uh, it's pretty old, probably 1970s, early 70s. It's warped. So it's warped, but it's uh, that's not necessarily a death sentence. If you don't care if your circuit board's warped, and you may not, then uh, it's reusable. Somebody would have thrown this out, though, most likely. But if you're scavenging, you're probably not going to find these little tiny chunks of board. These are scraps, probably. What you're going to find is a whole truckload of that. 
you know, penalized, whatever. I think I got this from a flea market. The guy bought out a company that closed, and I have a whole stack of this. This is perfect. It's kind of flimsy. It's kind of flimsy. It's a really lightweight circuit board, but that's okay. Especially if you're making small boards out of this, it'll uh, it'll it'll be a lot more sturdy in small pieces. But uh, this is the kind of stuff you might want to look for. You'll probably actually you'll see something that looks like that. Just fiberglass. You know, be curious. Flip it over. But you know, hey, this could be used even if it was damaged. This could be used for all kinds of stuff. You know, even things like this. This is clearly like a power bus line for some gigantic industrial piece of equipment that somebody probably went out of business trying to sell. And here we have it. You know, you could use this for a power bus. Drill some holes through here, put banana jacks on it. There's some plenty of things you can do with this. Pretty much any electronic supply store is going to have a variety of etchings. I'd suggest something a little more environmentally friendly than ferric chloride, but regardless of what you get, there's something you need to keep in mind, and that's uh, you're dealing with acid here that'll eat a variety of materials, including your hands. So, invest in a pair of those. I think you can buy them at most uh, hardware stores. It's chemical gloves. Nice, big set of chemical gloves. And, uh, oh yeah, that. It's going to be really hard to solder later on if you're blind or you don't have any fingers, so I would suggest some safety gear. Probably should consider a chemical-proof apron as well on keeping some baking soda or whatever type of neutralizer your etchant requires. Don't wear any clothes you like. If you splash etchant on your clothes, there's probably going to be a hole in them when next time you wash them. While you're wandering through flea markets and places like that, you're going to come across seemingly meaningless boxes that are, you know, you have no idea what they are. Your eyes will glance right past them and not even see. There might be some hints in the booth as to what that box might contain. So if you start seeing old electronics or uh, books about electronics and things like that, and you see these stacks of cardboard boxes, ask the uh, person to see if you can look and in those boxes or ask if they know what's in the boxes. Old electronic parts look like old cardboard boxes most of the time. Shoe boxes, tissue boxes, surprisingly enough, I once came across an entire garage filled with tissue boxes, floor to ceiling, all the way around the perimeter. In those boxes, meticulously organized new old stock, salvaged components, 50 or 60 years worth of components. So don't underestimate uh, the value of digging through old boxes if you're looking for parts. Your ultimate goal will be to get them down to a single box that contains some selection of everything you need, no trash. You might condense 40 cardboard boxes down into a single box like this one here, which is a 15 liter sweater box. I try to keep an index card showing what is in that box. It's not a comprehensive inventory of the box, but if I'm searching through a box, my index card might give me a hint if it's the wrong box or not. There may be clues in the booth that will tell you what could be in the boxes. If you have the time, it's always worth looking through boxes. Your first hint that there's electronics might be something that looks like this. That's meaningless. Take the time to look through boxes and see what's in them sometimes. As you can see, this box is full of plastic containers. You might dismiss that as trash, but, you know, this is a box of plastic containers. You know, what can you do with a plastic container? Well, what can't you do with a plastic container? This is even branded. This is an aesthetic. This might have held a mic element or some other aesthetic component. Somebody might buy it just for the brand name on the box. What you might do with a plastic container is organize your parts for kits. This is just a dial light. It's a seven segment LED display with a driver built into the board. All you need to do is supply logic. So I've included a ribbon cable and the data sheet in a plastic box. 
and look, the dial light fits the plastic box, so you could even build your circuit right in there with the display shining through. This is my standard unit of measure. It's a 15 liter sweater box. 15 liters and 5.7 liters are the only size boxes I use. They kind of stack together better. I can stack all the 5.7 liters up on the top and the 15 liters on the bottom to weight the shelves down. So I use these heavy duty plastic shelves. You can buy them at most hardware stores. They hold a thousand pounds approximately, about 200 pounds per shelf. They're pretty sturdy. Obviously keep the heavier stuff toward the bottom. This is generally the largest I'm willing to allow a collection of something to be. This is miscellaneous circuit boards. That's all the miscellaneous circuit boards I'm ever going to have. If I get more, I'll recycle some. I don't want my house filled full of stuff, but I do want some useful things laying around. I try to keep them organized. I tend to put them in bags, like items in bags, simply so they don't get confused. Bags are cheap. Trying to find a part when they're not sorted out is expensive. I keep a lot of mechanical stuff, but I don't keep more than will fit in this box, generally. Uh, I actually probably will sort this box out even further and bag some things up. You know, all kinds of stuff. I have many light components in here, and they're not organized at all. I don't like that. I can't find things. If I need a tuning shaft or something, you know, I'm going to find one. In here? Yeah, actually I did. I found like 30 of them. But it took me three hours. So, I try to dedicate a, a couple hours every now and then to sort out a box of something into bags or whatever. I use these bags generally for everything. They're small, you can buy like a thousand of them for three dollars or something, I don't know. They seal up so your parts don't spill out. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed.